Well, good morning. It's 730. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to Grand Rounds, everybody. Uh, a few announcements before we start. Um, we don't have any speakers scheduled for March, so our next Grand Rounds will actually be April 1st, and our presenters will be Dr. Sunny Linneburn and um, Scott Pearson, our PharmDs, and they'll be giving their annual new drug update. Our next journal club will be March 11th, and our presenters will be Megan Gauze and Annie Gabrielski. Other announcements, after today's Grand Rounds, you will receive an email with a link to a recording of the presentation as well as um, a copy of the slides. And it will also include a link to an online evaluation of today's presentation. So if you could please take a moment to fill that out, that would be much appreciated. Um, during today's presentation, feel free to submit questions um, as we go along in the Q&A box or the chat box, and we should have time to get to those at the end. So I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Andrea Stand. Um, Dr. Stand is a native of Kansas. Um, she attended both undergraduate and did medical school there and then came to Colorado for her internal medicine residency. After she finishes her geriatrics fellowship with us, she does plan to move back to rural Kansas. And Dr. Stan describes herself as a 90 year old woman at heart because she enjoys building miniatures and working on jigsaw puzzles. She, so she has um, picked a great um, uh, career in medicine. So we're pleased today to have her talk to us about prostate cancer. So welcome. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so today we are gonna talk about prostate cancer. I think it's a very applicable topic to our patient Andrea, population. We can't hear you. I think you're, are you muted? Oh, I hear her here. Can everyone else hear me? I hear you here. Yeah, I can hear it. Can anyone not hear me other than Carrie? Yes. No. I think it's on Carrie's end. We're, we're good here. Okay. And it looks like yeah, everyone in the chat box can hear. Okay, so sorry, Carrie. Um, so talking about prostate cancer, as I said, I think it's really applicable to our patient population. Um, a lot of our patients either have prostate cancer or have had it and have already been treated in the past. So our learning objectives today, um, be able to utilize the most up-to-date screening recommendations for prostate cancer, um, since this has been so controversial in the past know how to diagnose and prognosticate prostate cancer, and then be able to identify treatment options available depending on what stage of prostate cancer they have, and then be able to identify long-term complications in patients previously treated for prostate cancer. And I think that this is important because a lot of our patients have been treated you know, 10 years before even meeting us, and it's important to keep these complications in mind when treating them for other things. And then also to learn about treatment options that are currently under investigation. So a little bit of background. Um, prostate cancer is actually the second leading cause of cancer death in men. And that was surprising to me. I mean, it's obviously the second most common cancer in men, but the second most common death cause of death in men was surprising just because you know, all the controversy around screening and the great survival rates that we have with our treatment. Um, at least five and 10 year survival rates. And also, you know, I, looking back at all the patients I've seen, um, there aren't very many that I can think of that passed away solely of prostate cancer complications. So that was um, surprising to me, but that um, is an actual statistic. So um, at the time of diagnosis, about 90% of patients are diagnosed with localized cancer and the other 10 have metastatic cancer. Um, and then 60% of people who are diagnosed are above the age of 65, which is important for when we talk about when we screen. Um, and then the five-year survival for localized cancer is 98%. Um, and for metastatic, it's 31%. And because the percentage of metastatic at diagnosis is so low, that makes the overall survival for both types together um, still close to 98%. Um, so 
risk factors. Um, anyone who has a first degree relative with prostate cancer has double the risk of development of prostate cancer in the future. And that's even if they haven't, ha they don't have any identified genetic mutations. And there are a lot of mutations that um, are contributed to prostate cancer, but some of the most common are BRCA mutations and also Lynch syndrome mutations. Um, um, African Americans have a much higher incidence of prostate cancer and then also more severe disease at a younger age than other populations. Um, and then as with any type of cancer, age is gonna increase your risk. Um, and there's also a higher incidence in North America and Northern Europe um, and a much lower, um, a lower rate among Asian populations. And that's theorized that it's because of obesity and diet um, because actually over the years as some of the Asian populations diets have become more Americanized, their rates of prostate cancer are coming up also. Um, but we don't have any great studies that, that uh, prove this. Um, it could also be just the genetic makeup of these populations. So, and then also agent orange exposure has been linked to prostate cancer. Um, if you have a patient at the VA um, and they do have prostate cancer and agent orange exposure, um, that can be a service connected um, illness that, so that everything is covered with it. Um, so something good to know if you treat VA patients. And as far as screening, so, you know, this was previously really controversial over the past few years. Uh, most of the organizations are kind of on the same page, finally. Um, so first off, screening versus diagnostic ordering of a PSA. So for screening, that's just, as we know, just asymptomatic. You're solely just screening to see if they have if risk of prostate cancer. For diagnostic, um, that's anyone who you think who has symptoms and you want to rule out prostate cancer. Um, and actually most prostate cancers are completely asymptomatic until they're metastatic. Um, and they'll have symptoms like weight loss, bony pain, things like that. But usually the patients that with prostate cancer who have lower urinary tract symptoms, it's actually from BPH and not the prostate cancer itself. And that's because most prostate cancers are on the outer edge of the prostate and not in the core. And so um, some physicians count LUTs as a symptom to um, order a PSA, but I, you know, I think if, if we were to do that, in our patient population, we would be ordering PSAs on everybody um, because they all have it at, at the age that we see them. So, you know, don't think that's such a great idea in our population. Um, <clears throat> between 1993 and 2017, the death rate from prostate cancer has actually reduced by half due to screening and treatment. Um, and so there are a lot of urologists that are concerned with um, the now less aggressive screening that we do for prostate cancer, that this rate is going to start to increase over the next decade or so. So we will have to see on that. Um, and then as far as screening recommendations, so the USPSTF um, does recommend age 55 to 69, that it's shared decision-making. Um, <clears throat> And the number needed to screen for that is 1,000, which that means you would have to screen 1,000 men for a total of 10 years um, to prevent one cancer death. Um, and then they say age 70 and older do not screen at all. Um, the American Neurologic Association used to have much more aggressive screening recommendations, but as of 2014, they are now on the same page for the most part um, with the USPSTF um, as far as their screening recommendations. They do say um, they actually consider screening earlier at age 40 to 54 in higher risk individuals. So patients who have family history, African-Americans, people like that. Um, for age 55 to 69, it is the same. It's shared decision-making. And then for age over 70, um, they say do not screen unless they have a 10-year life expectancy. So they do open it up a little bit more than the USPSTF. Um, the AUA also says if you do choose to screen, um, to do it Q2 years rather than annually, and they found that the benefit is about the same and the um, risk is lower for overtreatment, overdiagnosis. Um, and then they also want us to only refer a patient to urology if they've had two elevated PSAs, and that's because there are 
plenty of reasons why um, you could have a transiently elevated PSA. And so they want us to, if you have an elevated PSA, to repeat in one month, and then if it's still elevated, send them in. Um, that being said, if they have an abnormal DRE, they should be sent immediately. So how do we diagnose? Um, I think this is really important for us to know um, the procedure and the risk factors associated with it so we can discuss it with our patients if we are considering screening because they need to know what the next step would be if they were to screen positive so that they can make an informed decision on whether they want to be screened or not. Um, so we do diagnose with a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. Sometimes they do transperineal biopsies also um, if they can't get a good visualization with a transrectal. Um, they typically take five to seven core samples and that's to increase you know, the amount of tissue they have to, so they don't miss a diagnosis um, and the, the risk factors associated with taking that many cores is not much higher than just with one core. <clears throat> so the side effects or risks associated that are common with this procedure. Um, patients typically have limited rectal bleeding hematuria for about a week, um, and then they have blood in their ejaculate for up to a month, and that's completely normal. Um, some of the more rare but serious complications from the procedure would be urinary obstruction secondary to prostate inflammation, um, acute prostatitis, and they actually give um, antibiotics before and after the procedure to try to prevent this, um, and then rectal bleeding requiring intervention. And then there's some question that this increases risk of erectile dysfunction, but it's not really um, for sure. And then also tumor seeding is a rare but a small concern. Um, and then if you have a patient that um, you know, they use local anesthesia. So if you have a patient that's higher risk, you don't have to worry about general anesthesia or anything for the procedure. So risk stratification. So once we have a tissue biopsy, we use three different scores to determine how high is how high of risk does this patient have for future development of metastatic cancer or poor treatment um, outcomes. So the three scores that we use, we use the PSA, a Gleason score, and TNM staging. Um, and these also, they help us not only determine prognosis, but they they tell us what treatment options are available for the patient. So the TNM staging is just like with other forms of cancer. Um, it's T1 means it's not palpable and you can't see it on imaging. T2 is that it's palpable, but it hasn't extended through the prostate capsule. Um, T3 is that it's extended through the capsule. And T4, it's adhered to other structures outside of the prostate. And then N is whether it's extended into the lymph nodes sorry, there's a cat, whether it's extended into the lymph nodes, and then M is whether it's metastatic or not. Um, so the next part of the risk stratification is the Gleason grade groups. And so we've been using the Gleason grade and score for a long time. It's a little bit convoluted because we have um, added on to the Gleason grade over time to make it more sensitive to tell us what the risk actually is for um, different patients. So first off, the Gleason grade, um, that is just based on growth and growth pattern and degree of differentiation of the tissue biopsy. So it's scored from one to five um, with higher scores, meaning less differentiation. So higher scores also being linked to increased risk of metastatic disease or poor outcomes after localized treatment. And then um, because the tissue biopsy is typically, there's more than one Gleason grade in it. It's not just made of one type of differentiate or one level of differentiation. We use what's called a composite Gleason score. So you just take the numerical grade of the two most common tissue types or differentiation patterns in the biopsy and you add those together and that gives you the composite Gleason score. Um, and then we use, on top of that, the last part is the Gleason grade group. And that's made up, it's determined by the composite score and the pattern. And the reason for that is you could have a Gleason score of seven if you had three plus four or four plus three, when four plus three or more of 
grade four differentiation is worse than a higher amount of grade three differentiation. So the three, four plus three has a higher risk than three plus four, but they both have the same score. And so the grade group divides those two to make it so that you can tell that it's higher risk uh, depending on what the actual differentiation pattern is. Um, and here is a table that shows us, you know, what the different risk, um, what the different risk levels are, depending on these three scores. So <clears throat> we first have very low risk patients, and this is just for localized cancer. So this is not metastatic. This is localized prostate cancer, and the risk factors help us determine kind of how we treat them and the risk of, as I said, developing the metastatic cancer or having a poor treatment outcome. And so the very low risk patients are those in the T1 group um, have a Gleason score of six and a PSA under 10. Low risk is T1 or T2 with also a Gleason score of six and a PSA under 10. And then intermediate risk is T2 or a Gleason score of seven or a PSA between 10 and 20. And then high risk is T3 or a Gleason score of eight to 10 or a PSA over 20. And as you can see, if you put very low risk and low risk together, um, about one third of patients at time of diagnosis fall into each one of these groups. Um, so now for treatment of localized prostate cancer, depending on their risk score. So for patients who are low risk or very low risk, we have several options. Um, so the first is observation. Um, that's just no further testing or workup if, unless they have symptoms. And this is typically used for patients who have less than a 10 year life expectancy. And then there's active surveillance. So for patients who do have a 10 year life expectancy, um, we, you can do active surveillance, so no treatment, but you do a yearly DRE. You do a biopsy at one year after the initial biopsy, and then how often you do biopsies after that determines on what grade of disease they had at the second biopsy. And then you do serial PSAs and um, you watch the PSA doubling time. And if it is less than three years, then they typically move patients in the active surveillance into the active treatment group. Um, and the active surveillance actually has a 15 year metastatic free survival rate of 97%, which is excellent for not um, treating somebody. So. Um, and then as far as the treatment options, um, the first is external beam radiation. So the short-term side effects of this, about 50% of people get cystitis and 20% get enteritis. Um, a small number of those become chronic, about 10% get chronic cystitis and enteritis. And then long-term, about 70% of patients do get erectile dysfunction from this. Um, and then a radical prostatectomy, um, you know, it's a surgery, so the side effects typically are a little bit more dramatic. So um, short term, they tend to have, um, it's very common to have urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. About 10% of patients end up with chronic urinary incontinence and about 40% end up with chronic erectile dysfunction. Um, you can also do for um, patients in the low risk category, you can also do brachytherapy where they insert um, radioactive um, bits into the prostate. Um, and so that is an option. Um, and then there was actually a study in 2017 that showed that there was no difference in 10 year survival for patients in the low risk group who got either active surveillance or either of the active treatments. Um, but there was a trend in improved survival for patients over 65 who got the active treatments, but it wasn't significant. Um, and then patients receiving active treatment did have a decreased um, disease progression and decreased metastatic disease at 10 years. So the next risk group is the intermediate or high risk. And we typically do um, external beam radiation plus um, androgen deprivation therapy with a GnRH agonist, um, such as Lupron being the most common that we use. Um, this has been shown to delay the rate of disease progression. Um, and for high risk, we typically use external beam radiation plus a GnRH agonist. 
plus six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy after radiation that has been shown to improve the disease-free um, um, survival and also overall survival for patients in this group. And then there's castrate resistant localized cancer. So this just means that you treat them with um, whatever therapy you chose and their PSA did not respond to it or their, um, or their disease progression on imaging did not respond. Um, so what we typically do um, is if you have a patient who does have castrate resistant localized cancer is you order their PSA every three months after you've noticed that the castrate resistance developed. Um, and then you calculate a PSA doubling time. You also do serial imaging every six months to see if there's um, progression of disease on there. And the treatment that we typically use for this is if their PSA doubling time is less than 10 months or they have more aggressive disease, um, then we offer them enzalutamide, which is an androgen receptor blocker. Um, in, in addition to the androgen deprivation therapy that they're already on, which is usually gonna be the um, GNRH agonist. And then for a PSA doubling time more than 10 months, um, it's less aggressive and we typically just observe them um, and continue them on the androgen deprivation therapy that they're on. So um, how do we monitor patients after we've treated their localized cancer? We typically do a PSA every three months plus a DRE annually. And we do that for at least the first year. And what we expect to see with the PSA differs um, depending on what kind of treatment they had. So the radical prostatectomy, the PSA should be undetectable immediately um, because you took out their prostate. Um, but for the external beam radiation, um, the PSA actually falls gradually and it'll reach an adhere, um, but it, it's usually still detectable. Um, and so if we are doing their serial PSAs and um, the PSA increases and we call it a PSA recurrence. So um, that's defined as either two, two um, PSAs in a row that have increased or after radiation, a PSA that has increased more than two points over the nadir. Um, so if you have a PSA recurrence, then you order imaging to see if there's evidence of metastatic disease or disease progression in general on the imaging. Um, if there's not any progression there, then it's called a PSA only recurrence. Um, and when you have a PSA only recurrence, so you can't actually see that the disease is progressing, it's just that the PSA is going up. Um, that, you know, we typically just use observation rather than treating. And we just watch the PSA, we continue to do serial PSAs and watch the doubling time. If it's doubling time is less than 12 months, then you just order serial CTs and MRIs to make sure that you don't see um, imaging progression. And then depending on the patient or the doctor, sometimes they do decide to treat um, with a PSA only recurrence. They typically do um, androgen deprivation therapy um, and they sometimes do intermittent rather than um, continuous, which is what you do when you're initially treating. Um, and then you can also do salvage radiation or surgery, basically whichever treatment they didn't have before you try the other. Um, so treatment of metastatic prostate cancer. So we typically do external beam radiation plus androgen deprivation therapy. And we already talked about the GNRH agonist or Lupron um, being the most common that is used in general, but you also have other options. So you, there's orchiectomy, which is very cost-effective and efficient, um, fast-acting, but because of the psychological toll um, it has on patients, we don't use it very often here in the States, but it is still first-line treatment in a lot of other countries. Um, the GNRH agonist or Lupron, there's other, other um, brands other than Lupron, but that's typically um, what we're using. So this um, binds to the GNRH receptor. And it actually, initially, because it's an agonist, um, initially increases the release of sex hormones um, for a short time before it starts to block it, block the receptor when the receptor gets um, kind of burnt out uh, from, from the um, sustained um, binding. So 
patients on Lupron can actually have an increased like symptom flare and disease flare at the beginning of being on this. And so a lot of times we place patients on not only the GnRH agonist, but also an androgen um, and an anti-androgen to prevent that flare. And then the GnRH antagonists, um, Degarelix being the most common, this is similar to the to Lupron, except for it antagonizes the receptor. So you never get that increase, um, initial increase in sex hormones. Um, and so that can be used also. Um, and then we monitor the disease response with PSAs and serial imaging. So castrate sensitive metastatic disease. Um, we Several studies have actually shown that longer disease free survival and overall survival rates if we do six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy in addition to ADT. And this is the same medication you saw in the high-risk localized cancers um, for having a better outcome. And so the docetaxel, it's a plant alkaloid or antimicrotubule. Um, Short-term side effects are common for you know, most of our chemotherapies, fatigue, weakness, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, leukopenia, anemia, fluid retention, and then nerve damage. So for castrate resistant metastatic disease, um, we have, you know, none of our treatment options are, are great um, for improving survival, but we have what we have. Um, so the primary treatment options that we use um, is docetaxel plus prednisone. And we just discussed that's an antimicrotubule or abiraterone with prednisone. So this is a CYP17 inhibitor um, and it blocks androgen synthesis within the tumor. And then there's enzalutamide, um, which is an androgen receptor blockade. Um, this binds to the androgen binding site of, in, of the receptor in a non-competitive fashion. And then we have some secondary hormone therapies um, that we do not use as often um, because they're older, they don't work as well, but they're available. Um, we have addition of anti-androgen if they haven't been exposed to it prior. Addition of ketoconazole or anti-androgen withdrawal and use of other estrogen forms. And patients in this population for castrate resistant metastatic disease should actually also be started on a bisphosphonate or denosumab regardless of their T-score, because in this patient population, it's been shown to not only reduce their fracture risk, but to reduce their bone pain. Um, and here's just a table form of the medications that we've discussed. Um, and there are a couple on here that we didn't discuss that aren't used as often, like the tumor vaccine um, and then bone sinking, sinking isotope, which is more just used when they have uncontrolled um, bony pain. So side effects of therapy. Um, the, for ADT, a short term, they typically have weight loss, fatigue, gynecomastia, ED, and anxiety and insomnia due to vasomotor activation. And so in my patients that I have on Lupron right now, the anxiety and insomnia have actually been the most bothersome to them. So something to consider. And then long-term, um, obviously we have osteoporosis. And so um, it's important to know if you have a patient who had prostate cancer before you knew them, um, it's important to know what treatment options they, or what treatment they had for their prostate cancer, because you'll be needing to screen um, the men that you normally wouldn't with a DEXA every couple years. Um, and then because of the osteoporosis risk, patients start on ADT, need a DEXA when they start the ADT, and then they should be on vitamin D and calcium from the start of treatment. Um, and then cardiovascular disease, they have an increased risk for that. And then also uh, increased risk for clots long-term, which I was a little bit surprised by that. I'm not sure what the mechanism is for that um, long-term versus short-term, so. And then radiation, and um, we already discussed, you know, erectile dysfunction um, and some cystitis and enteritis that can be short-term and then also long-term, but something else to consider um, is urethral strictures. Um, so, if you have a, a patient who comes in and they had a history of prostate cancer and were treated, and now they're having either 
symptoms of obstruction or overflow um, or just, you know, incontinence that doesn't quite sound right, um, that's something to consider a cystoscopy for to see if they have um, strictures. Um, and then docetaxel, um, we already discussed side effects of that, but some one of the chronic ones that we should consider is um, peripheral neuropathy. So if you have a patient that has really bad neuropathy, but doesn't have diabetes or vitamin deficiencies, and you're not quite sure why, it's, but you know they had prostate cancer in the past, it's important to look and see what treatment they had for it. Um, and then prostatectomy, we discussed that, you know, about 10% of people get chronic urinary incontinence from it. And it's actually a stress incontinence is the type of incontinence they get, um, which we, we don't see very often in men. So if you do see that, um, and you know they've had a history of prostate cancer, it's important to look and see what treatment they had. Um, and we, just like with females, we would try on pelvic floor PT, but if that doesn't work, um, urology actually considers them for surgical placement of artificial, of an artificial urinary sphincter, which I've never seen done. So I think that's pretty interesting. And so I wanted to discuss some of the most um, recent studies released on prostate cancer therapy. We have a lot of, um, there's a lot of studies on therapy because we don't have great options, especially people with metastatic prostate cancer. Um, but this is the most recent release that we have. So this was released in the New, Engl New, New England Journal of Medicine in um, December of 2020. And this is survival with olaparib in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Um, so olaparib is a PARP inhibitor um, that has been shown in previous studies to reduce imaging progression of metastatic disease in patients with certain genetic mutations. And this study wanted to see if there was an actual change in survival rates and not just imaging progression. Um, so this was an open label phase three trial um, where they randomly assigned patients to receive either olaparib or the gold standard therapies we use for um, castrate resistant metastatic cancer being enzalutamide or abiraterone plus prednisone as the control therapies. Um, they divided the patients into two different cohorts. So cohort A was pa were patients that had a um, BRCA mutation or an ATM mutation which are two of the most common um, mutations that we see with um, prostate cancer. And then cohort B had patients who had one of 12 other um, genetic mutations that are seen with prostate cancer, but are less common. Um, and they did allow crossover to olaparib um, after imaging, if, if the patient had progression of their disease on imaging and chose to switch over um, while they were on control therapy. And so these are the results. Um, so you can see um, actually before analysis, because they had the crossover, about 66% of patients transferred from the control therapy group into the elaborate group. And so because of that, they have crossover adjusted analysis for both of the cohorts. Um, so on the right, you can see in cohort B, there they did show that there was a uh, better survival rates in cohort B olaparib group, but it was not significant. Um, and then for cohort A, they did have a significant change in their survival um, so on patients that were on olaparib versus the gold standard therapies. Um, so the survival rate on olaparib for cohort A was 19 months versus four on elaparib versus 14.7 months on um, the two, either one of the control therapies. Um, and so they had a significant hazard ratio and p-value for that. And then they also, their crossover, um, they their analysis, the sensitivity analysis that adjusted for crossover um, from the control therapy also showed um, a significant hazard ratio and p-value. So, in cohort A, um, as I said, they did have a significantly longer survival rate compared to the gold standard therapies. The risk of death was 31% lower with elaparib than with the control therapies, despite the substantial crossover from control to elaparib. 
And then there have also been phase two trials that have shown that anti-tumor activity with PARP inhibitors in patients with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer actually varies depending on what um, genetic mutation they have. And they had consistently higher response to the PARP inhibitors with BRCA2 alterations. So that explains why patients in cohort A, which had the, it was BRCA or ATM mutations, had a much better response or significant response compared to cohort B, who had the 12 other genetic mutations. Um, so, you know, this, you know, olaparib is not going to apply to all of our patients because we don't do genetic testing for a lot of them, but it is something to consider um, for any patients that you do have that have tried treatments that have worked in the past. And that is it. Any questions? Thanks, Andrea, that was wonderful. Um, just checking in the Q&A and chat boxes to see if anyone has questions. Please feel free to submit those. So I have one question, um, is whether you favor uh, USPSTF or AUA recommendations for screening? So I, well, I favor the USPSTS, TF, um, you know, I don't think I have screened, even in my patients who have a 10 year survival, I don't think I've screened any of them. Um, so, I typically follow the USPSTF. Um, if you did have a really robust patient who had brought it up themselves and had a family history or something like that, I probably would screen if they felt strongly about it. But um, I think I, I tend to err on the side of less aggressive. <laughs> And I do see what are the recommendations for managing, preventing the increased CBD and AD risks following treatment. So I didn't see any specific recommendations, but I think it's just something to keep in mind if you do have a patient, you know, there's not much we can do because if you had somebody like at over age 70, we're not gonna start them on aspirin or statin anyways, because the recommendations are against that unless they actually have um, known CAD. So it really doesn't change what we're doing. It's just something to know if you have somebody who, you know, doesn't have diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and they do have CAD, something to consider on why um, they might have increased risk for that. Did you see anything about cryotherapy, which UCH urology does tend to do for localized treatment. No, I didn't. And I I went through the AUA website on their most common treatments and I didn't see anything about that. So I'll have to look into UCH and what they're, what they're doing. There's another question in the Q&A box is, um, did you come across any new screening methods that are being researched, urine tests for genetic mutations to detect prostate cancer, um, and any hope that PSA will be a thing of the past? Um, I did not look into that. I did see, you know, a couple things listed, but there wasn't a lot of information on it, so I didn't go into it, um, but something else to look into for things that might be coming up in the future.
and they were, you know, I did see, um, they were considering doing like a one-time process, like a one-time PSA screening at one, one age where we do it on everybody. Um, and then we quit screening after that. Um, but none of that's kind of gone through yet, so. Any other questions for Dr. Stand? All right. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. This was this was great. And um, everyone, thanks for joining in and please um, be on the lookout in your email for a link to the presentation as well as an evaluation. And um, we'll see you again on April 1st. Thanks everyone.